anyway, welcome to the, the podcast. So uh, the kind of comically named Talking Balls podcast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm your host, uh, Michael Wright. And with me today, really pleased to say, is uh, one of our, our tour players. And uh, it's Steve, Stephen or Steve Holworth. So um, hi, Steve. Hi, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thanks a lot for, for joining us. I, I think hopefully... The listeners will get something out of this in terms of just learning more about you as a person, but also, you know, what it's like being a pro on the tour. Um, and I'm a bit anoraki like that. So for me, I, I just really enjoy meeting people involved in the sport and, you know, it gives you different angles on it. So appreciate you coming on and thanks a lot. No worries. Not a problem. So, so to open up, really, I mean, <clears throat> I'm in Nottingham, so I'm not that, hopefully not that far from you if you're over. Are you oh, still yeah. in Lincoln? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was in Nottingham yesterday actually playing Michael. So uh, yeah, I often I'm often. Oh in okay. Oh, what Michael Holt? Yeah, yeah. Play over at his club there sometimes, but pro probably once a week now. So yeah, Nottingham's literally 45 minutes down the road. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's dead handy, isn't it? Oh, oh that's good. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm trying to get Michael on actually, and uh, so you can talk about his coaching as well. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, we'll see if we can get that one sorted out. And he's a Forest fan, I think, as well, like me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's quite cool um it says on wikipedia now now i know that wikipedia is like the bible in that there's never anything inaccurate in it it's always perfectly accurate we know that but it does say on there i don't know if you've checked it or whether you wrote it but it says on there that the, you're the only ever qualified professional snooker player from lincoln is that true yeah i believe so yeah i don't think there's ever been another um professional snooker player from lincoln um so yeah, I think uh, there, there was a guy um, a few years ago that may have had a season on the uh, on the circuit when you could um, buy your pro card. Oh yeah. Um, but I mean, I'd have to I'd have to check that out. I'm not I'm not 100 percent as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that, I suppose that is true. Yeah. So do you get like you know the freedom of Lincoln or you know you know that big hill all the way up to the cathedral? Do you kind of get yeah. a procession every year or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be nice to get a lift up there though. If uh, particularly on our <laughs> Christmas bar crawl, it's a bit of a bugger getting up there. But uh, <laughs> no, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great night actually, isn't it, Lincoln? Um, with, yeah. with the Christmas markets in particular. Mm. Yeah, it's developing a lot as well, Lincoln. It's becoming. Uh, a really nice sort of place if you like particularly up around the cathedral like you say the Bailgate area loads of nice yeah. uh, bars and restaurants and stuff so yeah I love Lincoln yeah yeah I was always impressed actually you know after the London I think it was after the London Olympics the golden um post boxes started popping up in Lincoln um, yeah one up near the cathedral actually um and, and it, Lincoln City, so we're here on the day i mean we're recording on the day this won't go out necessarily today but recording on the day where it's the semi-finals of the euros and i know this isn't mm. about snooker but you know we're, we've got the uh england denmark game and um i think are you an imps fan are you a lincoln city fan um i follow i do follow lincoln yeah i wouldn't say i'm a huge football fan now i used to play a lot when i was um when i was younger up until i was about 16 17 but um mm. they sort of lost touch with it for a few years really but i've always obviously followed lincoln closely being my hometown and born and bred here. so yeah Link lincoln's sort of always been my team if you like yeah yeah they were, they were close actually this year weren't they they almost got into yeah. the championship which um, yeah what a story that would have been yeah fantastic yeah yeah, when the brothers left, you kind of wondered whether they would carry on doing well, but actually they, yeah. they're still punching there, aren't they, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. So, so back to snooker then, you know. So I guess one of the things that's always useful to know um, about players, especially at this point, as we look at a new season, but I also think about last year. Um, I mean, it was a weird season in a lot of ways, wasn't it? How do you reflect when you look back at last season? Um, yeah, it was. It was a weird season, like you say. Obviously, um, it was all quite new to us, um, playing sort of behind closed doors and obviously everything that went with it, you know, testing for um, COVID and isolating and, and all that. It, it was very different. But in terms of snooker itself, you know, the calendar was still quite busy for us. And mm. um, obviously, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to still practice, um, prepare right for events and obviously still compete, which was the main thing really I think it goes to say we was, we was all probably worried at one stage we might not have had any tournaments mm. playing if you like so um yeah we was very fortunate really because there was a lot of sports that did just shut down completely yeah. so yeah it was it was a good year and um results wise sort of I, I felt it was it was a steady season if you like uh I felt like I probably played better than my results suggested mm. but um 
sort of finished the season well with a good run at the Worlds, which sort of salvaged it for me, really. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Do you feel any different approach in the Worlds? You know, it's obviously such a big event, isn't it? So much attention. Does, does it feel different to most other tournaments? Yeah, there's definitely that buzz around it. It's um, it's an event I've actually never won a game in before. So I've always sort of run people close in the first round, 10-8 to Luca Brussel, 10-8 to mm. Michael White a few years ago. Mm. Uh, so I've always been close. But yeah, to, to get the win, I was obviously buzzing. Um, I did prepare really well. And I had a, I, I think uh, in the new year, I only had the Pro Series event to to sort of prepare so I had a lot of time yeah. away from actually competing so a lot of hours spent on there and and uh, working hard and yeah it seemed to seem to pay off in the end yeah and, and is this your regular haunt then for the the practice is this a club that you go to or have yeah you got this, this is the, my in the, this in the is, extension and no uh, this is my table yeah um it's actually on uh RF Waddington on an RF mm. place just outside of Lincoln yeah um Funny, like I suppose it's not your everyday snooker hall, if you like. But uh, my dad was in the military. Uh, oh. He was based there for a number of years. Served twenty four years in the military. So um, when he eventually retired, we had access to this facility here, which mm. has always been a snooker room. Um, and then when I turned pro, I bought a star table and just sort of asked them if if it would be okay to sort of house it in here because this room was never really used. So yeah, it seemed like yeah. a, a waste of a, of a nice room, if you like. So yeah, they mm. said, yeah, chuck it in there and 24 seven access. And yeah, it's, wow. it's perfect. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And, and for view, obviously viewers on the YouTube, you'll be able to see this. So we, we've got a great shot. It's an iconic snooker player professional in front of the table, which couldn't have dreamed for more really. But, but if you're not, yeah. I can describe to you that, you know, we're, we're Steve's in this room with the, uh, with the table just behind him. And it, it looks like it's, is it just the one table in the room then, is it? Uh, no, they've got my tables here and then uh, there's a Riley aristocrat table just there. We've just had that recently installed. Um, just there so yeah. i'd swing the camera around but it's balanced but yeah it's just it's quite a spacious room really so it's nice it's good to have two tables in here because if the lads that are in the military come in on a lunchtime and whatever they can have a knock on there and, and yeah. i'm pretty much here every day so yeah oh, yeah. oh cool oh I, I was in the RAF actually i've been at wallington uh, not on a posting but i was there just to do I, i've got mates over that way Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was a, I was a medic in the air force for twelve years, so uh, oh, yeah, nice. they know Waddington quite nicely. They do the big air yeah. shows there, don't they? Yeah, I'm not sure if they're going ahead anymore now, you know. But we were, we always used to come to the air shows. I used to love it. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's an interesting place actually. It's quite secretive, isn't it? I mean, there's not a lot yeah. I can tell anybody, but uh, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot, lot of secretive stuff with the, the the kind of the radar and the surveillance yeah. work that they do. Yeah, that's quite heavily based here, isn't it? All the surveillance and stuff. So, mm. yeah, not not too much we can probably discuss. <laughs> no, no. Did you move around a lot then as a kid? I mean, obviously part of a military family, often <clears throat> that's the way. But was that it for you? Um, no, I didn't. My dad was in the military before I was um, born, if you like. Uh, he was ba He's from North Yorkshire, my dad. Uh, right. My mum is from down south in Aylesbury. Um, mm. And he was based, so he he travelled about a lot, um, like spent a lot of time based over in Germany. He was over in uh, Bosnia, the Falkland Islands, mm. stuff like that. Um, but then when I was uh, born, mum and dad sort of chose Lincoln as their sort of place they wanted to. It was quite central to them both. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously dad got posted to the to the base here, so they just settled. And uh, yeah, so I, I never never moved about, which was ideal, really. Yeah, yeah, no, that's useful, isn't it? It's a bit more settled yeah. by the sound of things. Yeah, and um, so so it was a, a good end to the season from your point of view, going back then to that in terms of you went out <coughs> a bit lifted, really, and obviously on the biggest stage, and, and obviously having fans back as well. How was that? Yeah, it was great. Um, I was obviously delighted to get a couple of wins in the in the qualifiers, obviously mm. gutted to, to not get through and make my Crucible debut, but Mm. Yeah, it was really good to see the fans back at the Crucible and yeah. obviously this sport thrives a lot off um, the crowd participation and obviously having that support behind you and family and friends and whatnot. Mm. So, yeah, it's great to see and snooker's only going in one direction in my eyes and, and that's upwards. So, yeah, plenty to play for. 
Yeah, and I suppose that's what I was getting about at with the with the whole thing about the fans and the the venue and the whole buzz. Really, you know, as a pro, do you tend to, <laughs> do you just tend to stay around for the whole tournament? You know, so whatever point you 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 leave it, if you leave the tournament before the last stages, do you tend to stay around it and soak up the buzz, or do you prefer to stay away and watch the bits you want to watch? Um, I think I think obviously if if you get beat, the the first thing you want to do is just get out of there straight away. Yeah. Really, but yeah. um, I suppose it depends. If it's a UK event, I'd probably come away. But if I was mm. if we was playing abroad, um, obviously you're restricted to what sort of flights and stuff you can get home. Yeah. So yeah, I've always sort of um, stopped about and carried on watching the snooker and stuff. So yeah, but obviously if if you lose, you just want to sort of get out straight yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, understandably. Yeah, and and if you got, I mean, you, you said you you're practicing. I think with um, you're doing some work with Michael Michael Holt, who's yeah. uh, Nottingham fella. Um, uh, who are your mates in the game? And have you got mates who play that you're close with? Yeah, there's. A, I've, I've got to know quite a few of the guys. To be fair, you know, I've always been good friends with Oliver Lines. We sort of grew up together mm-hmm. through the amateur ranks. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, play a lot of, uh, over in Grimsby with Stuart Carrington. He's always been a close practice partner of mine. Um, just got to know Michael the last sort of few few years, really. And obviously, mm. being so close, it's handy to have Michael on the doorstep. Really, he's a great player. Yeah. Uh, ben Wollaston over in Leicester. But mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I'll. I'll I'll go about and play anyone, but yeah, off the table, got got a few good mates, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. And, and how does that feel on the table? Because I, I guess the bit that would be useful to get an insight to and how much you can say, really. But yeah, from the outside, you obviously see it's very polished. Everybody's turning up, all dressed up, ready to go. There's not always interaction between the players, and I guess that's the nature of the sport, anyway. Everyone seems ultra focused. But how how is it for you as a player, you know, so that part when you're behind the scenes, uh, uh, do you have like dressing rooms? I mean, do you mingle outside of it and then, you know, put on the serious face for the cameras? How does that work? Yeah, the, um, backstage usually there, there's always a player la- player's lounge at events, obviously at the bigger events that you mm. might get a dressing room. I've, uh, I'm yet to experience that yet, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's always a player's lounge. So pretty much everyone's sat about uh, chatting, uh, just as if you was down the pub really I suppose everyone yeah. gets on and there's not really anyone that I can think that doesn't get on with each other so but yeah as soon as you as soon as you go out and and play obviously it's serious business then yeah yeah definitely is, is there anyone that, is there anyone that you feel that they have a you know a certain aura about them or you know is anyone treated differently the, the obvious one is Ronnie O'Sullivan isn't it um, yeah, um, Ron is always going to have that aura around him. You know, if you know, he's like a, mm. obviously the, one of the greatest players we've ever had, really. But I think a lot of the top players, sort of backstage, <clears throat> I often still find myself looking at him and thinking, "Wow, that's that's Ronnie or that's Mark Selby." But yeah. you've got to remember that I'm a pro now and I'm here to beat these guys, and and obviously they're going to try and beat me. So yeah, you've got to just treat them as competition. Now you can't you can't sort of um, be in awe of them if you like. That was for when I was a kid. I guess the uh, I guess the other bit is 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 kind of the bit. I guess the other bit is 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 kind of the bit around when you're when you're working on the on the table with the players. I suppose there's just something about um, if you're at the table, you can kind of control things to a degree, can't you? That's something I've talked about with some other people around. It's different to say tennis, where there's that knockabout and you can affect them as well. But when you're at the table, I mean, it doesn't matter who sat in the other chair if you're putting together a big break, really, does it? Yeah, that's it. That's sort of the uh, the great thing about snooker, really, and probably goes back to the um, the age old question of snooker probably being one of the hardest sports in the world, really, because, like mm. you say, if you're sat in your chair, there is absolutely nothing you can do, and there's nothing you can influence on the table. It's completely out of your hands, which makes su- snooker such a, a a psychologically difficult game to play. Mm. Um, but yeah, you've just got to try and do everything you can, obviously, when you're at the table, but. Mm. Like say when when you're not there, it doesn't, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, and how do you deal with that? I mean, I play. There's a group of us in you know in the podcast. We're kind of friends with the Snooker 19 PlayStation League, so we play the the game on the PlayStation, and we we've got like a league as well. It's competitive. There's about 40 people in it, but there is that bit where you sat down and you you're against a player, and they just they're just hell bent on breaking the reds up. I mean, some of them will do that almost off the break if you leave a loose red, and then you sat there for like. 15 minutes and you just, well at home you can go away you can get a cuppa you can go and you know walk around the garden and hope they're finished by the time you come back um yeah. <laughs> i can't imagine how it is for you if you sat at 
at the at the side of the table waiting for your turn again. <clears throat> I mean, how do you keep focused and you know almost get back again when it's your turn if you've been sat for a while? Yeah, that's that's still something I'm learning to to sort of deal with, if you like, being mm. a new new guy on the tour. Um, it's it's incredibly difficult. I can assure mm. you that. Uh, you know what you're thinking. Snooker is ninety percent between the ears, I believe. Everyone can play to a to a very high level now. You know the standards ever increasing, mm. um, but how you think and how you conduct yourself when you're not at the table um, can sometimes be the difference between winning and losing matches. Because you know, as you know, if you, if you've ever played snooker, literally anything can happen on on the snooker mm. table. And if you're not ready, or if you're not mentally ready when your opponent misses, to then come to mm. the table and obviously do the business, then you're not going to win very many matches. So it's important to obviously try and stay in that zone mm. um, of concentration and obviously be ready for, for your chance if it comes. But yeah, that's that's the most difficult thing to do. Constantly tell yourself to be ready and, and think positively if you've just missed a sitter. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think, you know, I've kind of taken interest in, in Michael Holt just from being Nottingham. And I think he's been on record saying at times that he sometimes finds it hard to shrug off mistakes and almost, you know, that bit around getting over it and moving on and yeah. putting stuff behind you. I mean, is there anything you can, or is there anything you do do to work on that in terms of that mental toughness or, you know, the way to um, handle that side of it? Yeah, it's, it is a difficult one because like you say, nobody really knows what you're going to think about when you're at the, when you when you sat in your chair but um i think a lot of it comes from self belief uh, mm. um, if you really do believe in yourself and and you back yourself then um obviously w when your chance comes along you've then got to just sort of brush everything aside and and just think about it's at the end of the day it's just potting one ball getting on the next ball yeah as easy as that sounds but <clears throat> yeah just positive thinking and mm. just really sort of dialing in on that side of it it's so easy to go down the route of thinking negatively and oh, I've missed this, missed that. But mm. at the end of the day, when you just break it down and in simple terms, really, that that's gone now. That's history, and and you can yeah. only look forward and sort of move on from that. So it, I mean, it, it is incredibly difficult. But yeah, it's it's mm. a lot easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do, do you are you one that practices a lot? So if you're at a tournament and away from home. Do you get time to practice? Do you get like allocated slots? I'm not sure how that works really. And maybe some listeners uh, yeah, would so, like to know. Yeah, if you if we're playing in the professional events, um, we have like a an app now which World Snooker mm. and the WPBSA have developed. So we can we can go on our app, uh, see when obviously we we're due to play. Um, if we have to go down the day before, or whatever, we can sort of plan our schedule and uh, yeah, mm. we get allocated. So I think it's like two practice sessions a day usually like 30 minute sessions a day so okay yeah if i if i was playing say one o'clock in the afternoon i'd probably pop over for a knock at half 11 12 mm. o'clock uh, get ready and yeah i always try and just keep my arm going but i'm a big believer that the practice is done before you get to a tournament there's a lot of guys that <clears throat> you see peppering the hours on the practice table even at yeah. events and and uh, i just think you know we've we've spent all week or all month preparing mm. for that event what's an extra 20 minutes going to do at the venue you know you need to just sort of mm. get into the right headspace and prepare right for your game and just chill yeah. out really because it's quite an intense environment and obviously we can put a lot of pressure on ourselves other mm. people can put a lot of pressure on us so just try and get yourself into a good space really yeah I, i've always wondered watching it whether there's ever mm. anybody who plays mind games as much as they can you know almost when you're in the line of sight and they're sat down, whether there's anything, you know, they've got to be careful, haven't they? And they'd probably be, you know, reprimanded yeah. if they did anything obvious. But I wonder if there's any of that going on or, or people, you know, trying to get a mental edge over their opponent because it's such a big part of the game, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's quite an old school thing that, you know, back in the day, you'd probably see little things here and there that would probably be done to try and wind up an opponent or just to try and get in the head. Uh, mm. You don't you don't see it so much now. Like you say, the referees are, are pretty on it and yeah. everybody's sort of just on a level playing field, really, in terms mm. of respect for each other. You know, snooker's still classed as the gentleman's sport. It's a smart, it's a smart game, mm. um, you know, we, all the guys, the, the men and the women, we all conduct ourselves in a way that we, we show respect to everyone, really. So mm. you don't, you don't, I mean, there's always going to be a few guys that will throw a little tantrum here and there and, and do something maybe to, to try and, but it's, mm. it's very minimal now. 
Right. Yeah, I guess it's that bit around, you know, maybe st standing up before the shot's over or things like that, or yeah, you know, or, or a little bit of an air, a punch in the air when you, you're doing well on your break. There was a video yeah. of that a little while ago, and I think it was premature because it didn't win the frame in the end. But um, yeah. <laughs> so it's funny when you see stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I just wondered, I, I suppose it's, yeah, as you say, it's a gentleman's sport and it would probably stand out a mile, wouldn't it? Because it's so calm in the in the situation it would stand out a mile if somebody was trying to just try yeah i think on that's one of the good things about snooker really you know everybody is super honest and mm. you often see on tv like if there's ever a foul or if you sometimes the cameras can't even pick up on it but you as a player mm. know and and 99 times out of 100 people are admitting to to their to their mistakes right. and their fouls and, and if and if like you say if anybody was ever stood in in your line of shot it literally mm -hmm. just takes a second just to ask and sit down. And, and yeah. more often than not, the player doesn't realise they're doing it. You know, you're so focused and right. and concentrating on what's going on that you often, it might just slip your mind that, oh, maybe I am in the line of that person's shot mm -hmm. or whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's 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 difficult one because I, I think a lot of the guys now, you know, we're, we're all doing this. It's We're all playing for for our livelihoods now. So mm -hmm. um, there is that mutual respect. And, and at the end of the day, the snooker will do the talking, if you like. Yeah, yeah. I guess slow play is the only other one. I, I was listening to a podcast the other day with, uh, I think it was Talking Sneaker Guys, and they were talking about slow play and whether there's penalties for, you know, just taking too long. Because that's the other way, isn't it, where you could almost not obviously break the rules, but you could wind someone up if you're just taking a lot of time over shots that look like they're fairly mm. obvious. Yeah, I think there is still a, um, a few guys that um, are particularly slow, but it's it's a really difficult one for me to sort of comment on because I'm quite a, a naturally quick player and mm. I think quickly, I see the shots quickly. Um, yeah. If anything, me playing slow in the past has put me off. So, yeah. and it's and it's knocked me out of my own rhythm. So it's difficult for me to comment on somebody that plays to a, to a slower pace um, mm. because that might be their natural way of playing. Um, yeah. It's difficult. To, I mean, the referees have been vocal recently in asking players mm. to sort of speed up and, and make a decision which I think is good I, and I'd encourage that I think there needs yeah. to be more of that in snooker mm. um, because at the end of the day it's an entertainment business it's mm. a sport mm. crowds want to see good play the breaks flying in I know snooker isn't all about big breaks that so you're going to see tactical play and mm. stuff but mm. yeah in general i think snooker needs to improve that way and that will that will just attract a, a, a bigger crowd and and bigger opportunities if you like so yeah it's difficult yeah. to comment on slow play <laughs> yeah yeah and, and you mentioned earlier like linked to that you said that you felt the game was in a good place and it was in a good position to keep improving and getting more i say more popular but it's almost a resurgence isn't it because at one point it was absolutely yeah. massive i mean when i was a teenager it was massive in the 80s and that and you know steve davis dennis taylor 85 and all of that i mean it, it was just but of course there was only a few channels you could watch and it was dominating but now there's so many things people can do that it has to fight for that place doesn't it yeah, I, d I do genuinely believe that snooker is only going in, in one way and uh, it's growing um, not just nationally, but globally. You know, snooker's a, mm. a massive sport now and uh, the more countries we can sort of play it and compete in and obviously the more people that can get involved at grassroots level, mm. uh, it's only going to be a good thing. You know, people like Judd, they're great ambassadors for the game. They're young, hungry and obviously... He doesn't miss anymore so it's uh <laughs> it's it's great to see guys like that that have come through from a young age and uh, mm. obviously that's a massive incentive for people like myself you know to keep practicing yeah. and sort of try and get to anywhere near that sort of level because mm. it can only push the game in one direction and hopefully try and encourage uh the new generations to take up snooker mm. and obviously that's where the standard keeps increasing yeah yeah <laughs> And where's your aspirations then? So obviously you're looking, you know, you're, it's still fairly new on the tour in terms of where you're at and, you know, where, what are your aspirations? Do you set yourself targets or is it just about yeah, continually often, improving? Yeah, obviously the goal is to continuously improve season mm. on season. But um, yeah, in terms of goals, obviously this year, I had a steady year last year, put myself into a good position coming into this season. Mm. Um, it'd be nice to finish this season in the top 64 you know sort of keep my tour card and obviously keep my ranking points on my ranking which is imperative now yeah um, but yeah failing that <clears throat> obviously to 
to just stay on the tour would be great this year. I know I don't I don't really want to think too much about it because I know I'm playing well mm. enough to sort of break into the 64. Yeah. But yeah, it'd be nice to just sort of establish myself as a, as a player. You know, it's th these mm. two years you get when you first get your tour card can be quite intense. Mm. You can put a lot of pressure on it, you know, but the, the goal is to be a professional and make a career out of snooker. You know, that that's yeah. not a two year thing. That's a, that's over a lot of years. Yeah. So yeah, like you say, just keep continually improving and obviously mm. trying to go to the deeper end of tournaments, make some final stages of events Mm. Uh, yeah and obviously the rankings just take care of themselves with that if you're competing and performing at a high level the rankings will will take care of themselves yeah 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 there's almost no hiding places there it's quite quite no. clear where people are at really yeah. um, and, and we've just well we're starting up um for this season we're starting up like a prediction league and a, and a almost like a fantasy league like the fantasy premier league type stuff um just to try and get people to take more interest in the wider you know, in the tournaments, starting with the Championship League coming up. So yeah. I think again, it's that bit. And in the in in the in the fantasy one, you have to pick somebody, ten players, one from one to ten in the rankings, eleven to twenty, and so on. All right. So yeah. you know, and I think I think that would be cool because I think again, you know, if you're not into snooker, you could make the mistake of thinking there's about five or six players because you've heard of them and you just know the yeah. ones that you know have that profile. But actually. You know, the exciting bit is about seeing the peak for me anyway is about seeing the players who maybe at the moment are early days trying to make progress I mean, we had all of the lines on the other week um yeah. and he's ambitious and you know he's obviously got his dad to look up to as well but um it's exciting to think where guys could go to and almost seeing you at this point and to follow that trajectory and see that improvement um i mean and then that inspires others doesn't it to, to take up yeah. the queue and try it themselves yeah, definitely. I think that's the magical thing about sport, really. You can see youngsters coming through and obviously people can tip people to, to do well and obviously it might go well, it might not. And, and like you say, that, that's the great thing about sport, to, to follow a story as well mm. as a career. Um, yeah, you know, I'd love to, to obviously make a name for myself and do well. And, um, but you do need that exposure. And like you say, a lot of people that you talk to I mean, I talk to guys down the pub and they only know a handful of snooker players. Mm. I'd love for one day them to talk about players lower ranked. Yeah. Um, but that will come, you know, snooker's developing and it's uh, becoming a more global sport now. So mm. hopefully it will in turn give the players more exposure and people will get to know us all. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and you wonder, don't you? I mean, obviously, Judge Trump said some stuff about the image of the sport and, uh, you know, about how it's still quite old fashioned in some ways. But mm. it, you, you almost wonder, you know, darts and other sports are quite, they build up characters, don't they? And they almost focus on characters, even if they're not at the top of the game in, <laughs> in terms of their ability. But they get known because of a hairstyle or a colour scheme or whatever. Uh, yeah. I just wonder that that's something that it's ultra professional the way it's presented, isn't it? But in a way, apart from doing interviews or doing stuff with you know well snooker tour or, or the yeah. channels you're a sport how do you it's how you get your your character across and get people to kind of know more about you in a way isn't it yeah definitely i think you know as players we're always trying to develop uh, on the table but it's important to like you say get to know the players off the table um mm. everybody is unique and everybody's got uh, something different to bring to the table so and going back to, like you say, with Judd's comments about, about the, the dress code, I, I think he's spot on. You know, keep, mm. the, keep the smart dress code for the, for the Triple Crown events, if you like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, relax the dress code for other events. You know, what's wrong with polo shirts and trousers? And mm. it, just, it just brings something different, you know. It might, in turn, develop and open other avenues for snooker. And that can only be a good thing. Obviously, you don't know what's going to happen, but... Um, yeah, the dress code. It's obviously snooker's traditionally a smart sport, and we've always worn mm. Nicky bows. and And I personally love wearing my suit. You know, I've got right. no issue with with uh, with turning up at every event wearing a, a waistcoat and Nicky bow. But yeah, why not relax it for some events? You know, it's yeah, it's it, yeah. Why not? Like like a shootout in a way. That's kind of a hint yeah. of what it could be like, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It it might it might um, in a way sort of increase the standard because sometimes players can complain about being uncomfortable and mm. it does get hot in venues and obviously when you're all suited and booted it can it can be a bit uncomfortable yeah um, so yeah who knows it might increase the standard which can obviously only be a good thing 
you just need to almost uh, be a bit of a joke. Just get someone to do like body <laughs> painting, where you just have your whole of your your outfit <laughs> body painted on with just some budgie yeah. smugglers, and then yeah. you could be completely free. You'd probably find it as completely different then. Well, um, that would definitely yeah. bring in some viewers. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, I mean, we could, good to see where it goes, and I guess it's that bit around players like yourself coming through and that, the, the generation coming through the game now. It's you're probably in a good position to hopefully influence that and. You know, the more noise made about it, then the more people will want that. And, and obviously Judd's voice is a big one that's heard. So, yeah, yeah. It'd be, it's exciting, isn't it? I mean, I've only really re, re kind of re got, got into it again, really through the, through the PlayStation game, funnily enough. Um, yeah. and, and it's a real eye opener <laughs> to see where it's at. But also this the community. What I've really noticed is it's a fantastic community of people. And, and even just calling or messaging or tweeting players to say, would you like to do something and catch up, you know, I'm not sure there's that many sports you would do that in and expect to get much success, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, you are right in that respect, you know, that um, snooker players are quite vocal and and to be fair, I don't know many players that aren't up for doing things like this, podcasts mm. and, and chatting to people because, again, it's about increasing our personal profiles yeah. and obviously it might lead to different avenues of opportunities for us. Um, yeah, anything helps. And it's great to meet new people and get other people's um, ideas on the sports and thoughts. And, yeah. you know, it, it's it's all positive. It's great. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, the more we talk about it, the better. That, that's the thing, isn't it? it <clears throat> yeah, creates some noise. Um, so before, I guess before we wrap up then, really, Steve, I guess the other bit is that um, it'd be an opportunity for you to get a bit of a plug-in, actually, for, uh, for, for Susanna, <laughs> if you'd like to, because yeah, I know yeah. she offers something that, that um, is quite relevant to the sport. Yeah, she's uh, my partner, Susanna. Um, yeah, she's, she's, set, she's set up her own business now. She's a, a media makeup artist by trade. Um, she's obviously... Uh, experience in that field but she's set up on her own now to to sort of go down the, the makeup and beauty service route and uh yeah she's really trying to make a go of it now obviously lockdown was a big eye opener for her and mm. obviously um it made her realize how much she missed having their clients and getting mm. out there so yeah if uh, if anybody's ever listening to this podcast that um has got any opportunities in the makeup or beauty service industry um tv events yeah, Susanna's fully qualified and, and raring to go with it. So, yeah, it'd be great. Great. OK, well, we'll put details in the in the uh, description of the pod anyway, and we'll make sure that we, we perhaps tweet that out with this episode when it goes out. So, yeah, best of luck. And so so finally, I guess for me, I mean, best of luck for the season ahead. And um, it's been really nice getting to know you a bit more. I think there's a lot more we could have done. And maybe, you know, maybe later in the season when uh, you see how you're getting on and perhaps you'd, you'd come back and give us an update if you would. Yeah, defo. Just give us a call anytime. Yeah, always available. Brilliant. Well, uh, you know, all the all the best. I hope the the, uh, the listeners have enjoyed that and just hearing more about you and um, and I'm sure more people will follow your fortunes this season as a result. So all it's to say is um, all the very best. I hope you have a good season, and um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see the events that that really work for you. And I know as a quick player, maybe the shootout is one of the ones to watch out for as well. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, I'd take a good run in any event, to be fair. So, yeah, just hoping for that one good result and, uh, yeah, see where we go. Working hard, so optimistic. Brilliant. All the best, Steve, and um, we'll catch up again in the future. Yeah, cheers, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers.